Today's COVID update is brought to you by Full Tech Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service. And welcome back. Joining us via Zoom this morning is Dr. Fernando Cuellar. He is a relative uh, feature. He's always here on the show with us to discuss all things medical, all things health related. Good morning, Doc. Uh, we're going to discuss COVID this morning. Yes, good morning, Isani, and thanks for having me once again. All right, so let's begin by getting your input. I know that last week BMDA met and there were a lot of concerns coming out of that particular meeting in respect of the COVID response and uh, the overwhelming of the health system. Let's begin by getting your input on that particular topic. Yes, let me just um, clarify. Last week, uh, Thursday, I think it was, we had a meeting with the BMDA and we, we had a, an agenda a little bit different from um, what, what it, with some aspects of COVID, we wanted to discuss the private public mix. But definitely the main discussion centered around um, our healthcare system and the fact that we had gone over the capacity, we have been saturated with patients. And we heard different reports, different uh, discussions from our colleagues. Um, and I said then and there that I think it was my duty to say something to the public and I would have been calling the talk shows the following morning. Usually when I appear at this it is by, by invitation, either from yourselves or the other media houses. But I think it was the first time ever I've ever called into a talk show. And the only one I could have gotten into was Krem. Um, Love FM was always busy. And then Plus TV had some technical issue. So I did manage to call into Krem and identify myself made these um, facts known that, that this was from a BMDA meeting and I thought it was my duty. Mm -hmm. and, and not doing it would have been very unethical. And the main message, of course, was to the Belizean populace, not to the Belizeans on a whole, to let them know how dire of a situation we are in where our healthcare systems have been saturated. And I did say things to the fact that people can't get into the hospital, so they'll be dying in their cars and the, the parking lots and on the streets. And it generated a whole discussion, mostly good, mostly good. I don't have a Facebook page, by the way, so I, I get my reports from people around me. Um, one or two criticism, which is expected. Um, I think one that, that stood out in my mind was I was being categorized as an alarmist. I, I don't really mind taking on that characterization. Um, it, it, in my mind, and I still, today in the morning, will not, will not say it's an alarm. I'm a, an alarmist. I just want to be very truthful. Mm -hmm. um, which, of course, brings me to the point, how come the people in the administration, both past and present, um, they have to rebrand their messaging and of how they deliver the message because Sometimes you get the impression that everything is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Or everything lee bad, but this web are right now we're not lee bad. And I can be testimony I can be testimony to example I had three three calls yesterday. Um, one of a patient waiting in an ambulance to be admitted and they didn't have space. One of the persons at home um, that had gone to the hospital and was not admitted and the family felt that they needed to be treated in hospital. And the other one that definitely um, had all the major risk factors yeah. that would, within the next day or two, um, would, would, would perhaps require hospitalization. So this is, this is a living experience up to yesterday evening, Sunday evening. So, um, so let's I hear things. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I wanted to, to get some insight into um, you, you, you made this public announcement that, that people would die in the parking lot and, and um, you know, it's not something we haven't seen in other parts of the world. But what about the conversation or the meeting 
What were the reports coming out from the health institutions across the country that makes you believe that this is the critical phase that we're at? It's not about making me believe, Marley. I've been involved in this whole thing for indirectly for, from the time it started. Myself, uh, my two other colleagues, Dr. Riaga, Dr. Hidalgo, we have been very much behind the scenes developing protocols. I remember good in March, April, we were very much involved in developing the protocol for admission to the ICUs, the treatment, the different parts of treatment. So, and every so often, um, well, not every so often, every day almost, we get we get discussions that things are bad. The 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 new thing is that this was in a public forum of more than 200 participants in a BMDA meeting, mm -hmm. which then I realized that this is the time to, to say something publicly. So, um, and the tips are there, the, 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 the sessions are recorded. So I would challenge um, the media to get a copy of that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we should, I mean, it should be available to everybody of what was discussed in, in that meeting, no? Mm -hmm. and, and these are not quite our words, no? This, are, this was what was discussed in that BMBA meeting. And we, I did tell things that I was going to do that calling and make it public. Yeah. Now, your, 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 your point is that the public needs to understand how critical the situation is so that we can take it more seriously. Yeah, I, I, that's the main reason for having calling, for having sent this alarming message, if you want to call it that. Because it's, it's, it won't be dependent on any authorities to fix it. it. It needs to be fixed primarily from us, the Belizeans on a whole, mm -hmm. and, and have the numbers go down and the need for hospitalizations go down, and of course, deaths go down. We have to do this and stop, stop play hard is, you know, and, and do the thing that we're supposed to do. Now, the, the, at, as of this morning, we have 147 deaths so far from COVID-19. And uh, the re weekend reports were in one day, 10 deaths were reported. These are the type of scenarios that really do get people worried. But I don't know how much it translates into decisive actions about how we protect ourselves. Um, it seems that we maybe don't go to large gatherings, but we still think small gatherings without a mask are fine. Um, and so we continue to see this type of spread. Uh, you are always uh, championing a message of, of staying home, but it, it goes beyond staying home because then you have friends over and family over and you spread it there as well. Yeah, you're so right, Marlene. I mean, we've come a long way from March and each month, each two months, we've had to change our messaging and our strategies, but we have to change as, as the need arise, no? Um, definitely, I still think people had is and, and they gather more than the 10, and even when you try, yeah, it's more than just now stay home, like you said, no? It's not like people come to your house um, unless absolutely necessary. Um, and, and the main, again, I'm saying the main message is that we Belizeans have to do it. We can depend on, on the authorities to do it for us. They have their role to play, of course, but um, it's it's mainly from us. I think there's a there's somewhat of a challenge for government when you look at the fact that while we've gone through a shutdown phase for a period of three months earlier in the year, and what the economic fallout of that was. <coughs> And now that's not on the table to say we're going to do a lockdown again. People are moving as if though, you know, it's back to normal. Like you go places like, for instance, over the weekend, you have persons doing their Christmas shopping and the lines outside of these buildings, these stores are exceedingly long and people aren't abiding by any social distancing while they're mandated to have to wear a mask. They're not standing the six feet apart in terms of distance and what have you, but there doesn't seem to be any kind of, what would we say, um, enforcement that says, you know what, this is what the government is doing, this is what the police department is doing to enforce, and this is what the Ministry of Health is doing. It seems to be rather disjointed an effort at this point in time. What is your thought on that? I think you're perfect, right, um, Isani? We, we have been sending these messages and people doesn't, don't seem to abide by them. 
And we have to come as a group. I mean, I have my ideas, but um, the, the, uh, hopefully a newly COVID task force will, will say that, no? Uh, for example, I would uh, recruit uh, uh, two, three hundred 300 people in each city or urban area or even village and calling COVID police. Put by the name, for example, this over there and make them walk up and down the street, going at the places where people are most likely to gather and, and, and point it out that, listen, we can't, we don't overstretch with the police department as such. No? You hear chest up on the radio and everybody else that uh, so much they don't and our numbers are so, but we need for these crises, recruit temporarily ordinary people to help um, to do this. Just like I've said that you need to recruit for farmers and six farmers to do the testing and the contract tracing. These times of crisis require thinking outside the box. So you go, I mean, they have retired people, they have people with a good sense who could help to walk up and down the street, go to the major supermarkets, mm -hmm. wherever the fish market, and say, you put them on, but they identify themselves as a, some, some type of an identification that, um, and I'm sure that the, 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 the law people could come up with some way to how to give them a little bit of teeth to help to enforce these things, huh? Yeah. Let's go back to that point, that point with the testing, because it's one you raised last week in, in discussion with me, but I find it interesting because it, for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to be an idea that the government would latch on to at this point, which has to do with allowing other persons to conduct tests as opposed to only health or medical experts. Can you expand on that a bit? Well, for sure, Isani, I know I mean, words. I think it has been a big mistake from the governments um, in the past not to do this expanded testing. Some months ago, when this rapid test was, was okay on the international market, I even fought with my people here at medical that we just go ahead and do it and not get, have to get the authorization from the ministry. So go rogue then, because nobody that the ministry have more sense than we for, for, for examine one, one, one test and go through the CDC guidelines and the approvals and analyze it and, and use it. And I, I, I actually bought my people here at medical for do it. And then if they want to mess with me, we can, we got a quote. But definitely, we should have been doing this six months ago, five months ago. And, and the, the testing kits have been, and once it's used properly, and we, believe me, we, we here in the private setting, any private clinic, I know my colleagues, they have good enough sense how to use one test and how to interpret it properly. We don't need the Ministry of Health. I mean, it's good to be the famous stakeholders and collaborators, but it's a, it's a big fault not to have done it faster. And let me quickly add it, it's not just about doing the test, but the contact tracing. I was gonna okay, say so you could isolate the virus, and I've said it, we need 300 well, people in each district, we need people to do that contact tracing, and not, the, the, the Ministry of Health personnel is already overburdened, we needed to have recruited people, and I say this all the time, no one tell me and, and take $20,000 a month, you find that $20,000 a month or $30,000 a month, because it will, at the end of the day, improve our economy and our livelihoods because they go hand in hand. I, I think that's a really great point, the contact tracing portion. And that's my question oftentimes when I see in private facilities that, that people are getting tested. What is the, the communication if you find a positive case, for example, where you work, where there are uh, tests being done? Because contact, getting tested and being found positive is one thing, but uh, doing the contact tracing and secondly, ensuring that the isolation or the quarantine actually takes place at home because I may be positive and go home and still mingle in the house as I used to thinking that that is what isolation is and my family members or house members still move out. Yeah, we do what we can. I mean, with somebody positive, we would give them advice to, to self-isolate, to get these persons close to them. Get, um, But we don't have the resources in the private sector setting to, to hire a hundred that's that's the responsibility of the government and we are starting now some type of coordination with them but it's still in its baby it's its infancy where we we, we work together at that level mm -hmm. but again unfortunately i mean it's hard to go back and lament over things but it's something we've been doing we should have been doing very very um very long time ago and not all about the rapid testing 
we should have by now um, have one PCR machine in each region and to facilitate that, that, that easier thing. What are the bag lack now? 2,000 plus. Not a nonsense, man. We have to take better control over the lab and, and, and figure out. We need that task force to come up with these things so that we have a PCR testing in each region. We don't need it in each village, but we need it in each region so that the, the southern region can take care of their cases, the western, just like the famous decentralization, regionalization plan that should be in place when it comes to our healthcare system. But what is frightening, at least when you, when you really sit and think about it, the fact that if there's a backlog of 2,000 plus cases, a uh, test, sorry, tests, a number of these tests will turn out to be positive and people don't know definitively, yeah. de definitively that they are positive and they may very well be moving among us and but they continue shouldn't. to spread. If you've been swabbed, you should be in isolation. And right. I think a part yes. of the control... We get the results and we get timely results. Yeah. No res the right yeah. results don't no, serve me no benefit if I get it six days, five days after yeah. I get Precisely. Yeah. Okay. That's a nonsense. And I, who uh, myself working at the clinic, clinical settings, I need my results in our 24, 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Okay, for make I make meaningful decisions and help that patient better. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and that's, that's where I feel that we have um, perhaps not done enough. There are two parts of this. There is what is being done within the, the government level and the healthcare systems, and even by extension, uh, what happens in the private healthcare. But then there's also the responsibility that's being laid on citizens, where we right. know, because we hear reports, there was an outbreak in, in, a, in a company where the person was swabbed and went to work. And then when they found out they were positive, then all the contacts at work had to isolate. And that was right here in Belize. We hear stories yeah. in Orange Walk where people have signs and symptoms, all that have been explained, loss of taste and touch, and decide they don't want to get tested. They don't call mm -hmm. the Ministry of Health to go in and get swabbed. They don't go to the clinics because they don't want to test if they have COVID. So, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure how you overcome a challenge like that, but these are, very, these are the very same scenarios that will continue to perpetuate the mass spread of the virus that we see. Uh, I mean, we can't, we can't solve every problem perfectly, but I'm sure if we get more testing and more contact tracers in, in the districts, it will make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. we, need to, uh, we need to work along with the, the employers and say, you know what, if this person was tested uh, today, then you stay home until you get the results, yes or no. And I, 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 I what I want to be on concerted effort with employers, with social security. Um, so you can't tell somebody for stay home and, and expect them to eat. Yeah, they have to eat somewhere so that our social security come in. And then I hear a whole discussion about the fund and the, <laughs> the retirement. These are crisis times, guys. We need to do these things different. So here's a real situation, though. Okay. On Friday, I got a call uh, in my capacity as a reporter <laughs> from Punta Gorda, from someone at the PG hospital where they're saying that um, there are persons on staff who are exhibiting all the symptoms of COVID-19. And while one individual had been asked to take a test to, to be swabbed, they're saying you got to report back to work because we're short of staff as is. So it, it puts into context the very same concerns that we're raising, where we're saying that if you are exhibiting the symptoms of it and you're being asked to, to find out what your status is, then you should be allowed to remain at home until the confirmed or, you know, until the, the matter is dealt with, let me put it that way. But if you're saying, well, look, you still have to show up to work because we're short on the number of persons who are, you know, on duty, then something is fundamentally wrong with that, is it not? Of course, it's an, and, and that goes to the point when you talk about uh, some nice pretty words like surge capacity and bed availability. It's not just about having a bed yeah. there. It's an, I could put mm -hmm. 50 beds in a wee parking lot this evening. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that we could care for somebody in the parking lot. They don't have a bed. We need the human resources. And I said it over and over. We have already overwhelmed our, our human capacity. Um, poor nurses, and I have to say the nurses first, because we big time doctor, no, not technically as much as them. Mm -hmm. um, 
they are the one who they take click and they are stretched in and don't, they don't boss already. We don't have enough. So that goes to the point exactly what you're saying. And that is what I want to tell the Belizean people. That it's not just about the physical space, mm -hmm. okay? About the people taking care of them, our, our, our healthcare system, human resources is already um, overwhelmed. And it's a dire situation. It's a dire situation indeed. You said you got calls from people in an ambulance who were trying to get uh, space in a hospital. Yes, uh, yes. The patient, I could tell you, I can't mention names, of course, but the patient had COVID a week ago. And unfortunately, usually after testing positive, um, it's about seven days when you start to run into trouble. And so said, so done, the person was heading for, it was already on oxygen, was already using high flow oxygen for the past 24 hours and still having trouble breathing. And you know that patient, they head for intubation. And they were sitting in an ambulance, um, waiting to be admitted and, and could not get in. And the, the discussion was that we can, we full up here too. And Carl Yushna full up, uh, or had, they had actually some reservation of being admitted at Carl Yushna. And the, the, the person then says, say, well, they're that way, I can't go back where we come from. And, and yeah, they're home. That was a real situation yesterday, wow. guys. I know, they, I know they make this up. Yeah. Okay? I know they make this up. And the other ones were more moderate cases, but this is a man who required intubation. And like Abba Hori said, they have skeptics who have come out and say, well, we are here in the top of ventilation. I actually, they got people who still think the virus are not, not, are not real. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. I mean, let's let's hurry dismiss that. They not say why say ventilation is not the answer. Of course, that's not the answer. We try to avoid ventilation as much as possible. We try to avoid it. We have learned a lot over the past eight months how to ventilate differently people now than what we what we started with. I, I bring this because this are the thing we're going in your trachea, you know, with pipe. Mm -hmm. Okay, this are the thing where we push in there. This are not a nice feeling. Yeah. This this. They, they're using a mask, a much more comfortable feeling than this, you know, thing. And then this are the other piece of instrument where we use or put it in. See? This is why we go in on a bloody throat if we don't, we don't behave with ourselves. Yeah. yeah. And then... Our, our, our cruel dead guys, our cruel dead, the people, you're the suckier, your eye get big, you're the dead slowly. And I said it before, it, it, there were much faster, quicker death and get one nine millimeter bullet in your head. Than the dead, the soccer or a two, three days period. Mm -hmm. So I know, okay, who want to call me alarmist, but I want to put it all there straight forward that please make we do this together. Absolutely. The, 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 the people have to have the major part of responsibility and I'll hold the authorities put to the fire for them to think to differently. Mm -hmm. Now, you. But obviously, what we're doing not the work. Yeah. And those skeptics who would say, oh, it happened worldwide and look at what it happened in the States and Germany. Yes, but that no means that we are cross with hand and not, and not try and make only 75 people dead instead of 150. Mm -hmm. And when you look at, at, at um, I mean, I'm still, that story you said about the person who prefers to go home and die rather than wait, that's, that's kind of the situation that you were painting last week that would eventually happen. You work in a private facility here in Belize, and I know that you offer testing. Will you now explore uh, offering care as well? Marlene, we have a 30 meeting precisely for that. Because? Because we, we see the need. Mm -hmm. We see the need to do it, and we have to physically alter our building and our spaces to do it safely. Yeah. Yeah. We have to, we have to sensitize our nurses that Poor thing, they have to have our hazmat suit, 12 hours, 8 hour shifts, and it's not nice walking around in a hazmat suit all day, mm -hmm. even in a air conditioned area. Mm -hmm. So please, I mean, um, make, 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 make this thing work, man. We have to because with the tech leak as our country, our economy in our shambles, we need to get our livelihoods back as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, with the help of the vaccine, that will come along soon, we, we can meet this within the next six months to a year. Yeah. Now, let's, let's just do a quick refresher. And I know we've talked about this a lot of times. So people hear this, they get concerned. Um, 
and, and we know we should wear our masks. Some people wear their masks um, maybe not properly or not an adequate mask, like uh, scarves and bandanas and handkerchiefs. Those aren't enough. Um, but talk to me about some of the things that you see people do that you know are, possible, are possibly spreading the virus. Um, they may think they're being safe, but they're not. I think the next big thing for, for drilling are people ahead now that are, that are um, gathering of people. No? Yeah. Um, you're perfectly right when you say that um, the, ori the original infirmity that I developed earlier this year when I said stay the F home. Now, um, a problem for said stay the F home by oneself. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Instead, I got people over and yeah. got some excuse for some kind of gathering. I mean, we know birthdays happen and funerals happen and events happen, but we must put for feet that for at least one good six months and, and, and minimize the risk of transmission that way. Um, our public um, places or, or supermarkets need to enforce those social distancing, those um, because everything has become lax no? um, over the past three months. So we need, I can remember at the beginning, you had one person to spray your hand you know, they say that as much as often, and we allow certain people in you know, the buildings, Christmas shopping, they come. And I, I could see that happening. You could Christmas shop, but the, the, the stores them can have, okay, we, we figure out how much people we, we could get in at this space at one time, and we have the, the line um, go along, and perhaps we need to extend hours of shopping. Um, of course, everything will cost more money, easy for my guys say, but we we'll probably have to pay people more over time. Maybe expand shopping till midnight so people go shop 10 o'clock at night and 12 o'clock at night instead of after they all bungle up together one week. No? How do you well, how do you feel about the curfew that's been implemented? I know the I know the, the skeptics would say um, that the virus don't have one clock by hand and, and, and decide oh, okay at 10 o'clock now make a stop spread. But it will help. It will help. Even if that 1%, 2%, it will help. But also I've said it in other opportunities that I am not one of those who would advocate for any national shutdown. Yeah. We can't. Um, but we have to be strategic. We have to be surgical. We have to. And that's uh, what the COVID task force will need to do week by week basis. Uh, why? We're part of the numbers shut up this year. Then next week, we'll do this year. Okay? A very fluid, dynamic assessment every week. And, and I, I would have want those people on the COVID task force. Who, who started to buy the, 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 the sack of coffee because we're not asleep. Mm -hmm. We're not asleep. Okay? Yeah. You're not going to sleep 6 o'clock and you look like, I want to call you at 11 o'clock and do meeting 11 and figure out what our media strategy for the next day. We have to be like that. Shouldn't talk uh, media approach. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, you talked about the public-private partnership um, that can take place. What are some of the ideas you think that can be explored, uh, given the fact that our public health systems are so overwhelmed? Yeah. Um, Marlene, it's not about that can be, that should be explored. And we have the BM there, there. Um, unfortunately, even before COVID, there's always been kind of an adversarial connection between Ministry of Health and the BM there. Somehow our authority doctors, the DHSs, um, have removed themselves from becoming physicians and BMDA members. Um, there's a lot of, you know, in every organization, there's some egos to go around and, and that hampers uh, coordination and working together, but we should set those aside. And the BMDA have a lot of people that can help both intellectually and physically um, to, to, to um, help out the situation. I like, for example, um, we speak about COVID, but a lot of Belizean people require care that are non-COVID. Um, the heart attacks, the mm -hmm. pneumonia, the gastroenteritis, the uncontrolled diabetes, and these people are being affected because one, they themselves are afraid to go to institutions that, that because of the COVID. Two, there's a delay in, in diagnosis and treatment many times because the whole focus around COVID. Um, and that is what we need to partner with the private sector and say, you know what? Um, make we bring in uh, Dr. Kawich for say one week of calls at the medical ward while then why take one rest or one that I'm talking about here or one Dr. Godinez or one Dr. Quayar for help out and in each district we have that type of capacity but we need to work together and make, make, make the Ministry of Health do that man they must get a lot of sense 
Well, I was wrong. going to ask if the BMDA Sorry. has not been contacted. We are told by the, the new Minister of Health that there is a team of medical experts that are advising them on new policies. Um, it, has, the, has the BMDA been contacted to be a part of this panel? Because we haven't been informed as to who's on the panel. But very, inform, very informally, it was contacted in the past. Just because of this meeting last week, um, they have a, a, a letter being sent to the Prime Minister to offer services again. And I also would get after um, my colleagues to, 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 to get some more testosterone and some more um, estrogens so that they speak up some more. They sent a letter. Um, I'm waiting to see what will be the follow-up. But I'm hoping that there will be much more um, coordination and cooperation between the two things than, than yeah. last week. No, it, Unfortunately, BMD they don't have uh, legal teeth into a lot of things when it comes to healthcare and beliefs. So we, we could only step on the side, the, 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 the beg and the suggest, but it, it takes the Ministry of Health to rope them in. Um, because I know that they have good people in each district. And I, I keep saying each district because anytime we talk about anything concerning health, we already think about Belize City and Kalusha. But what about the poor people at Stan Creek and uh, PG and Cairo and, so, mm -hmm. and the Keys? So we need that private-public um, cooperation. Right. Well, uh, any final message to the public before we close? Um, Stop being as hard and do what we need to do. Yeah. Simple as Perfect. that. Thank you very much, Dr. Fernando. We appreciate you uh, having this conversation with us this morning. Thank you, guys. All right. And with that, we're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, tomorrow is going to be commemorated as World AIDS Day. And we're going to be talking about the HIV response in a pandemic. So please stay tuned. This COVID update was brought to you by Foltech Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service.